Philosophy has always been around, and it's certainly not problematic, as long as it's not contradicting the Torah. The problem with philosophy is not itself, but rather when people use it to go against the Torah. It's even a bigger problem if rabbis and different leaders are using philosophy to speak things against the Torah, but yet saying that this is the Torah. Parashat Chukat is an answer to all of those philosophers that are speaking against the Torah while telling people it is the Torah. After we go into there, we'll understand a little bit more details about why HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose what he chose in this parasha, whether it's the red heifer, or it's not allowing Moshe Rabbeinu to enter Eretz Yisrael, and in fact, what the death of Miriam was supposed to yield, and what it didn't. After that, we go into questions. Questions from people from all over the world. Things that bother them. Things they're interested in. Things that are important for everybody. And one of the most critical questions that people need to know the answer for, is when is it allowed to speak about people? Speak about their personal life, speak about their opinion of their life, speak about them during your Shulchan Shabbat. This is perhaps the most critical question that was asked tonight. There are others, and you're going to enjoy them. But most importantly, you're going to know this is the way to be holy. We're back here on our Wednesday night program of Stump the Rabbi. We're after some Divrei Torah. You guys will uh, ask some questions and Bezot Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers. Tonight's show will be for the uh, Refua Shlema for Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Joah, and um, Sarah Bat uh, Esther. Kadosh Baruch Hu Echotan Bekom Yikol Kol Them and all of the uh, righteous people that are uh, following our lectures, all of the people that are looking to cleave to a Kadosh Baruch Hu and his sages, Bezat Hashem. Uh, so uh, just a reminder for everybody, go to the Kiruv store that we have, get yourself some of the uh, new book. Uh, it's a constant reminder in every lecture for a couple of reasons. Number one, because I know I have, uh, Baruch Hashem, between the different channels, over 100,000 people that follow the different lectures, but uh, we certainly didn't get 100,000 orders. So we wouldn't be able to supply 100,000 orders, but the point is everybody needs to get a box of these books. If you have a uh, you know, community where you have at least 20 or more people that speak Hebrew, get some of these books. They're only in Hebrew currently. Bezal Hashem will have them in English at some point next year. Uh, but um, these books, Bo Hashem, have gotten great feedback in Israel uh, and also some good feedback in, uh, in the state so far. So get yourself some of these books. Uh, it's free. It's a good way for you to do Kiruv. It's a good way for you to uh, help other people get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Simply go to kiruvstore.org, kiruvstore.org, get some of these. Anyone that wants English material, get these cards, these uh, uh, Kiruv cards, where you can put them at different uh, shopping centers, uh, supermarkets, uh, different uh, kosher uh, restaurants. On the counter, people can take a card, watch one of the two movies that have inspired many people, Baruch Hashem, millions of uh, uh, views across our different channels. This is in English and also in other languages, plus you can get some of our USBs over there, Bezat Hashem. So, uh, for anyone out there that wants to uh, contribute to our organization, especially some of the new programs that we have, we have a... Uh, uh, a Kiruv station here in South Florida where a couple of our guys are uh, stationed every single day, Baruch Hashem, or five days a week uh, at different places around South Florida and giving people an opportunity to get closer to Hashem by giving them free books, both in Hebrew and English, uh, as well as the USBs, uh, and um, also helping people put on tefillin. So anyone that follows our uh, channel or Facebook or WhatsApp has been seeing these pictures, new pictures every day, Baruch Hashem. And uh, we're uh, right now, uh, last week we gave out over 250 books. So uh, it's, uh, it's a, a huge investment into the community. I, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we're going to continue increasing that. We just made an order yesterday uh, for more books from Eretz Yisrael uh, in English to provide to the local community. Uh, and uh, anyone that wants to be part of it uh, could uh, donate on our website at bezratashem.org or bhtorah.org or any of the other websites. They always have 
a donate page or any of you that are on Facebook right now watching the live, you could simply press the donate button under the video and you could donate as much as your heart and bank account allows. So with that being said, we have Parashat Chukat. Parashat Chukat is full of insights that are very critical to our lives, especially at times like this, as the uh, sages say in the Gemara Masechet Sota, page 49b, that at the end of days, there's going to be certain things that are going to be the opposite of what the tradition has been, the opposite of what we have known to be true, where in fact the truth will be hated and heresy will be rampant. And that's actually, unfortunately, one of the things that we are seeing. Many people pretending to be leaders, pretending to be rabbis, are misleading the public with many different things. And just today, somebody sent me a video where uh, this uh, 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 partner to uh, Manus Friedman, uh, this guy Yo uh, Yoni Katz, uh, goes to uh, the 770 Chabad Center, the headquarters of Chabad, and asks a bunch of different people uh, if they believe, you know, and he's, he's asking rabbis, he's not asking uh, just uh, regular people uh, that are uh, unlearned. Apparently, these are learned people, or at least they should be. Uh, and uh, he's asking these different rabbis from Chabad that are praying uh, at the uh, 770 if they believe that God needs you. And uh, to our dismay, uh, at least based on his video, the majority of them agree that God needs you. Some of them were normal and said that they uh, know that God wants us to do mitzvot, doesn't need us to do mitzvot, but unfortunately many of them, and I would say a rough uh, guess would be 70% uh, or more of the people, at least in that video, uh, agreed with Yoni and Manus Friedman that God needs you. And of course, this is apikosut. This is 100% apikosut according to all opinions of the sages. You will never find a source in the Torah that says such a statement. So to have so many people say such a thing, of course, this can create even more confusion. But of course, we always have our beautiful Torah to, uh, to delve into and delve into because everything is in it. And of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu always puts us at the right place and at the right time when he wants us to learn something. Parashat Chukat has one of the most critical statements that you will ever find pertaining to this particular issue. As it says, Zot Chukat HaTorah. This is the decree of the Torah, which Hashem has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and they shall take to you a completely red cow, which is without blemish, upon which a yoke has not come. So here the sages have a field day of different commentaries about the first part of the statement. We understand that there's a red cow, there's the laws of how to use the red cow, but Shlomo HaMelech himself says he doesn't understand it. Shlomo HaMelech that was given divine wisdom, that was given wisdom beyond any other man aside from Moshe Rabbeinu, and some say even Avram Avinu, but aside from that, Every human being that ever existed over the last several thousand years has not even come close to the wisdom that Shlomo HaMelech had. And yet Shlomo HaMelech is baffled when he gets to this parasha because in this parasha on chapter 19, verse number 7, it says that the very same Kohen that is purifying everybody by using the instructions of the, of the alachas of the red cow where they're taking the red cow, they're after they're slaughtering it, they burn everything, including the waste, then they turn it into, uh, it all turns into ashes, and then they use it to purify people along with some uh, water, the, um, the, uh, the water that's being sprinkled. Now, each time somebody touches a uh, something that's impure, and the Gemara in Masechet Psachim, Daf Yudalit, page uh, 14, has a uh, whole sugya from Rabbi Hanina Skana Kohanim, the Rabbi Hanina, the uh, the leader of the Kohanim at the time, and it talks about a, uh, the whole concept of tumah and tara, purity and uh, in uh, uh, impurity and purity. And uh, over there, there you know, obviously the uh, Gemara is in one of many places 
discusses Tuma and Tara, but this one particular source in the Gemara Masechet Psachim is the source for many of the other halachas uh, relating to Tuma and Tara. Uh, so for anyone that wants to understand the subject, this is the foundation. And uh, when it comes to purity and impurity, there are different things that uh, if a, a person touches them, they will become impure. If it's uh, one of uh, 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 several different types of crawling creatures, if they touch a, uh, a, uh, an animal that uh, died without, you know, that was, died on its own, some, uh, some type of accident, uh, or, a, or some other animal ate it and it died and somebody touches it, or another example is tumat amit, the tumah of somebody that died, which in that particular case, the highest level of tumah comes from a dead person, so much so that a person doesn't even have to touch it in order to become tameh. Everything else you have to touch. Everything else you have to touch, with the exception of the, uh, the tumah of a, of a woman that just gave birth, tumah of, uh, 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 of nida. Uh, the the zav, the zava, the different t- types of tumas. But generally speaking, every one of the tumas are something that you would have to touch, you have to connect to, except tumat amit, tumah of a dead person, where the tumah of the met is the highest level, so much so that anyone that's under the same roof as a dead person, i.e., in a cemetery or a, next to a dead body, if there was a war, somebody died next to them, they don't have to touch them. They're under the same roof. They uh, will become impure. And the only way to remove that impurity is with the paraduma, the impure waters. Hence the reason why everyone today is impure. Because the tumatamet, once a person becomes impure, he touches another person, he shakes their hand, gives them a hug, uh, and he makes them impure. He touches something, he makes it impure. This is called Avatuma, the father of Tuma, which makes other things Tuma. More or less, what ends up happening is that anyone that went to a, a, a hospital, anyone that has gone to a cemetery, anyone that has pretty much touched anyone uh, is impure. And the only way we will ever get rid of this impurity is once the Bet HaMikdash is built, the third Bet HaMikdash that's permanent is built, and part of it is going to be the ceremony of the Paraduma, where they take the red heifer and they uh, pretty much purify everyone. But interestingly enough, the Torah tells us that the Kohen that is purifying everyone, in essence, he himself is pure. He is taking the pure water of the red heifer and purifying everyone that is Tameh. He's Tameh because of this, he's Tameh because of that. A whole line of people, millions of people following, waiting for this little sprinkle of water to become pure. Once he completes his job, he is now Tameh. Shlomo HaMelech says, I don't understand. This is even beyond my understanding of everything. To show me that it's not something that we can possibly understand. And in fact, Rabotai Karim, the fact that something pure itself becomes impure in such a fashion is not something logical. And the Torah says, Zot chukat a Torah. This is the decree of the Torah. This is the decree of the Torah. Onkelos, Ager Tzedek, usually calls Chok statute. Anytime it pertains to uh, any of the chukim, any of the things that are pertaining to a uh, uh, mitzvot, he says these are statues, these are the different details of the mitzvah. But when it comes to this particular verse, he doesn't translate chok like he usually does, but rather dag zerat oraita. This is the, not the statue, but this is the gzera, this is the decree. This is the decree of the Torah. In order to teach us that when the Torah refers to the details of a mitzvah, such as the specific laws of the paraduma taught in this passage, Onkelos uses the the, uh, term decree, since the mitzvah's intricate halachic details are beyond our comprehension and must all be observed as divine decrees. 
So here, Onkelos clarifies it for us. When it talks about the mitzvot in general, this is a chok, this is something, this is the details, ta, 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 one, two, three, this is what you do, you go right, you go left, you pick up, you pick down, you go sit down, you uh, do all of the different things. But when it comes to the details of why this mitzvah is the way it is, that's already a decree. Meaning, because God said so. Because God said so. That's the reason. Rashi, on the other hand, is even more stringent. Where he says, Chok is always referring to the entire mitzvot that cannot be grasped by a human mind. Meaning, none of the mitzvot, not just the paraduma, aduma, not just the red heifer, but all of the mitzvot cannot be grasped by a human mind. So here we see Onkelos translate this particular decree as a foundation for all of us to understand what to believe and what to run away from. Because the philosophers or the rabbis that pretend to be philosophers or the rabbis that are given philosophical explanations without a sage giving them a foundation without a source that you will ever find in any place where they're giving you all of their philosophical explanations of how if he created us he must need us if we're doing it then he must need it and all of these different uh uh, uh word uh, uh, uh types of debates where they're simply f- focusing on the semantics instead of what the tradition has always been for the last several thousand years here the torah itself comes and stand up on its own and says to you zot chukat a torah this is the decree of the torah meaning all of the mitzvot are not needed by god all of the mitzvot are things you will never understand while you are alive why because that's how God created you. That's how God created you. You will not be able to understand. You don't have the tools to understand. You can understand what to do. You could understand different benefits of doing as the, uh, uh, the Sefer HaChinuch from 800 years ago or 700 years ago writes in the beginning of his huge, huge commentary on every single mitzvah. He says, these are just tamim. These are just like little tastes, little flavorings of different reasons of why we do the mitzvot. But the truth is, zot chukat Torah. The reason why we do the mitzvot is because God said so. That's the reason behind all of the mitzvot. So here we have a verse in the Torah that simply addresses the long-standing battle against the heretics that unfortunately are infecting more and more people that are connected to Chabad, that are connected to their teachers, that are trying to reinterpret the Torah, that are trying to reinvent the Torah without having any sources, without having any foundation whatsoever, by simply word playing. By simply saying, listen, it makes sense that since he told us to do it, he must need it. Why? Because I won't do anything unless I need to do it. And in so many words, they're minimizing God and humanizing him where they're trying to say we're in the same field. I only do things because I need to do them. I only tell somebody to do something because I need them to do it. Therefore, God must be the same as me. He only says to us to do the mitzvot because he, uh, he needs it. Why would he create the world if he doesn't need the world? This is 100% apikosut. Apikosut. This is heresy. So you understand what is on the line here. And I've said this once and I'll say it again. The Rambam in Ilchot Yesodea Torah says, If a goy, non-Jew, writes a Sefer Torah, not because he's uh, some Christian uh, idol worshiper, not because he's trying to make fun of it. He is actually, he's a righteous Noahide. He decides to write a Sefer Torah. 
the Jewish people find it, they cannot use the Sefer Torah, they have to bury it. A guy writes a Sefer Torah, you have to bury that Sefer Torah. He writes Tfilin, you have to bury those Tfilin. No one's allowed to use them. An Apikos Jew writes a Sefer Torah, it's a mitzvah. And some, like the Rambam, say it's an obligation to burn it. Meaning, a Jew that says God needs you, writes a Sefer Torah, it's a mitzvah to burn it. Writes Tfilin, mitzvah to burn them. Why? Because they are not apikos. So Rabotai Karim, you have to be very, very careful before you start putting your own brain right aside next to Akadosh Baruch Hu. Zot Chukat Torah. This is the entire Torah. Certainly there's commentary by different sages. There are different opinions about different things. All 70 different facets of the Torah. But don't ever think for a moment that you can just throw your hat in and say, you know what? Let me reinterpret the Torah without having any foundation or any legs to stand on. Why? Because it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. Zot Chukat Torah Rabotai. This particular parasha is literally written for the heretics. Just the beginning of it. Written for the heretics who try to understand Hashem in their own ways. We do not have, a, we do not have such permission to do such things. Furthermore, when you understand that Shlomo Amelech himself could not understand the reasons behind the mitzvot. What's greater? The mitzvot of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that commanded them. Normal people will say HaKadosh Baruch Hu is greater. He commanded them. So if Shlomo HaMelech cannot understand the mitzvot, how can we understand Hashem? What can we understand? Whatever he allowed us to understand by being clear about it. Whatever our sages gave us clarification about. We have no permission whatsoever to redefine the definitions according to our, uh, our uh, uh, language. Especially since most of these philosophers are simply arguing based on the English usage of words. Meaning that they're not interpreting things according to how the Torah is written in the Sfat HaKodesh in the Holy Language. They're simply playing semantics here. He wants, he needs, he this, he that. This Rabotai is Apikosut. Apikosut puts a person in a situation where not only they cannot be counted in a minyan, not only cannot they not be a rabbi, not only they cannot even be a chazan, but if they write a Sefer Torah, they are in a worse status than a goy that writes a Sefer Torah. As long as that goy is not an idol worshiper. If it's a goy that's an idol worshiper, like a Christian or a Catholic, then of course you have to burn that Sefer Torah as well. But the point being is, Rabotai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want us to burn any Sifre Torah. But he used this parasha to remind us that sometimes Sifre Torah will be burned. In fact, about 800 years ago, in the year 1242, according to their calendar, of the Gregorian calendar, during Parashat Chukat, the Christians who hate Jews as they are part of a sav decided that they are going to burn many Sifre Torah, many Gmarot, and in fact, 24 wagon loads of handwritten Sfarim were burned by the enemies of the Jews, which is the Christians. The Jewish people could not do anything about it. Aside from cry, aside from pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, why are you allowing your Torah to be burned by these idol worshippers? During that night, one of the Chachamim, some say it was multiple Chachamim, had the same exact dream. 
that Friday night of Parashat Chukat, they had the same dream that the answer to that question that the entire community is asking, why is HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowing His Torah to be burned by idol worshippers? And not just one Sefer Torah, not two Sifret Torah, not ten Sifret Torah, wagon loads of Sifret Torah, wagon loads of Torah. Why are you allowing these idol worshippers to burn your Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Why? Each one of them dreamt the same exact dream that the answer to their question is in this week's parasha, the same parasha that they were burned. In the verse, Zot Chukat Torah. This is the decree of the Torah. Why? Because I decreed it. That's why. No further explanation needed. You said it, we do it. You said it, we follow. You said it, we believe. Naaseh nishma. Any time a person tries to put on a hat as if they are in the same level as the sages, and needless to say, in the same level of God, and tries to word things differently, read, interpret things differently, try to give people an understanding that they can relate to, but not an understanding that has a kosher stamp on it. An understanding that people want to hear, that God is like them. That person is in the same category as the Christians that burned the Sifre Torah because those very same Christians turned the man into God, turned the God into three. Hence the reason why when such people Write Sifre Torah, there are no difference than those idol worshippers that burn the Sifre Torah. Both of them have to be burned. Now, the parasha continues discussing different things that relate to the paraduma, the purity and impurity, certainly things that we can learn from. And I see that the Facebook is down again. Baruch Hashem. People need to watch the Shurim on bh.live. Baruch Hashem, it's much more reliable than Facebook has been lately and certainly less distractions. Anyway, we have here different things that get impurity. One of the examples is an earthenware vessel. An earthenware vessel is unlike other things where if something impure touches it on the outside, it doesn't turn it into impure. Only if something impure touches its inside does it turn into into impure. And unlike everything else that becomes impure, the earthenware vessel cannot be purified. It has to be broken. Everything else that becomes impure can be purified different processes for different things but the earthenware vessel once it becomes impure because something touched it on the inside or it's in the same room as a dead person and it's not covered meaning it's a open uncovered vessel therefore the tuma entered it the air entered the uh, earthenware vessel this is something that uh, uh, leads to the people having to destroy that vessel now, one of the things that we had an idea of is that years ago, Chidush, where an earthenware vessel is what they used, the Kohen Gadol had used to give the mechatat, the, the, uh, the bitter waters, to the wayward woman, a woman that was accused by her husband of adultery, had to drink this water, and if she cheated on her husband, then she would die after she uh, drank this water. If uh, she didn't cheat, then she would get a blessing. But why use the earthenware vessel? Why not use something else? We thought that from this particular parasha, that just like if something touches the outside of the earthenware vessel, it doesn't impurify it. But if it's inside, it's impure and unfixable. The same concept with marriage. 
if somebody says things to a woman, you know, things are on the surface, but she doesn't actually sin, she doesn't allow any of the any of these people to do anything with her physically, then she's still permissible to her husband. But the moment she's intimate with anybody else aside from her husband, she's forbidden to her husband. She's forbidden for her husband. So, and the, the marriage, like the earthenware vis, vessel, the marriage must be broken. Furthermore, we continue going into the parasha and we see that in this parasha, both Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron and Moshe, and Aaron Akoin, both of them go to Gan Eden and leave this world. This Rabotai also shows us that the time difference between this parasha and last week's parasha, or two weeks ago parasha, has been 38 years. Two weeks ago, we heard about the Miraglim. The Miraglim, the spies, went to the land. That was during the second year when Am Yisrael was in the wilderness. 38 years later, all the bigger problems began again. Korach the, uh, 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 was, was one of them, and also what happened in this week's parasha after the death of Miriam. Now, this means that for 38 years, Am Yisrael saw open miracles. They saw a stone, a boulder, travel with them wherever they went. This boulder moved. It wasn't just like any, you know, a boulder that's in one place and that's it. This boulder moved with them as if it is literally a living boulder. And from this boulder came out a river of pure water that's unlike any other water in the world because this water was like the manna. Just like the manna would taste like any flavor that the person wanted, the water would taste like any flavor like the person wanted. And imagine, this river, I mean, people are bathing in it if they want to bathe. People are, uh, you know, doing any number of things that they want to do. Even though the Torah says they didn't have to uh, uh, bathe, they didn't have to do laundry because Hashem made sure that everybody's constantly clean from the Ananea Kavod, the clouds of glory. Still, if anybody wanted to jump into the water, wanted to swim in there, wanted to do anything in there, certainly they, 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 you would think, logically, that it would get dirty and uh, perhaps it wouldn't be the cleanest water in the world. That's where we have to understand. Our logic doesn't work. Our logic minimizes the Torah. And this water traveled with them. But the moment that Miriam passed away, the water stopped. As Am Yisrael did not mourn Miriam enough. Now, Generally speaking, one of the things that we know is that when a tzaddik or a tzaddikah dies and goes on to Shemaim, this is a atonement for Am Yisrael. Rav Nisim Yagen Alav Shalom, one of the most extraordinary Talmidei Chachamim, Kiruv rabbis and simply tzaddikim that lived in the last hundred years. He, over a period of nearly 40 years, helped Am Yisrael go closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, gave countless lectures all over the world. Baruch Hashem, they've transformed many of his lectures into books in different languages, in Russian, in Spanish, in Hebrew, and also in English. And I have to tell you that one of the reasons why we as an organization decided to, uh, to sell his books, uh, but also now we're giving them out for free in, the, uh, in, in our, uh, um, what we're doing here in, uh, in South Florida, is simply because it is the best of the best material. It's simply the best of the best material out there because it's not only truth, but the translation that was done was absolutely stellar. Absolutely amazing translation. It's very fluid. It's certainly on the upper echelon of translations. And the point being is, is that Rav Nisim again did an enormous amount of cube, helped countless people 
build Jewish homes. Countless people leave all forms of idolatry and heresy, literally built communities. But he died relatively young. He died relatively young. And after he died, it was discovered that he told one of his family members that he asked, he asked, he prayed for 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 refuah shlema. He prayed for salvation. He was connected to all of the greatest tzaddikim. If you look at the pictures online from Rabbi Again, literally, you see him literally next to every single tzaddik in his funeral. All of the greatest, all of the gedolei adol came. I don't think anybody out there, aside from maybe Rav Ovadia, merited to have so many gedolim cry at his funeral. Unbelievable. Certainly no Kiruv Rabbi had merited such a thing. But Aravya again was connected to everyone. Everyone loved him. Everyone knew his truth. And he asked for blessings. He literally gave blessings to people that worked in, in miraculous ways. On his, literally on his deathbed, one rabbi came to him to, to, to visit him and told him that uh, there's a uh, kid that's in a coma. And they don't know what to do. Rabbi again says, I'll wake up today at one o'clock. The rabbi was so enamored by this, he went to go visit the kid, and exactly at one o'clock the kid woke up. Literally, the blessing of the tzaddik came true, but he couldn't bless himself. Why? This was only discovered after he died, as he told one of his family members. That after a lot of praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it came to him in a dream where HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in essence, sent him a message. You have a choice. I can heal you right now. And you won't have this cancer. You won't die. You'll live many more years. But countless Jews are going to die because there's a decree on the Jewish people at this time whether it was a hundred thousand or a million Jews that were supposed to die, I don't remember, but it was an enormous amount. And certainly, the tzaddik said, take my neshama instead, let them live. Let them live so they could do tshuva. Let them live. So it is well known that when a tzaddik dies, this is an atonement for Am Yisrael. But yet we see, after Miriam dies, problems begin. The water is done, doesn't flow anymore. Uh, the, the people complain. Moshe and Aaron hit the sela, the stone, instead of a, uh, instead of speak to it. A lot of problems happen after it. The Zera Shimshon asks the same question, but also gives an answer. And he says that while a righteous person's death atones for people it only atones for them if the people realize that it was on the account of their sins that the tzaddik passed away if the passing of a tzaddik is accompanied by people doing tshuva then the passing serves as an atonement for people this is why even after the passing of Miriam the well dried up because although she passed away and this should have atoned for the sins of the Jewish people and in turn the water should have continued to flow the passing was not enough to bring atonement and blessing because it must be accompanied by the people realizing that the tzaddik left this world when the people are no longer worthy of him being there this is why it was specifically the para aduma, the red heifer that serves to teach this lesson, that the ashes of the Paraduma need water to be added to them in order for them to purify the impure. The ashes alone are not enough to purify anything. The same holds true with the passing of a tzaddik. Their passing alone is not enough to bring forgiveness to the people, and in turn a blessing. On the contrary, if their passing of the tzaddik is not accompanied by tshuva, Bad can follow chas v'shalom. Hashem yishmor v'yetzil. That's what the Zera Shimshon says on Parashat Chukat here. So here we see 
that the stories are not for naught. The stories are full of details, full of lessons that are as relevant today as they've ever been. Furthermore, we see in the Torah that after Miriam passes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe and Aaron, Kach et amate ve'akel, et ha'eda, ata ve'aron achicha ve'dibartem, el ha'sel ha'le'enem, ve'natan memav ve'otzet ha'le'en ma'im min ha'sel ha'vishkita et ha'eda ve'et ב'אירם. ויקח משה את המטה מלפני אדוני כאשר ציווהו. השם ספוק to משה saying take the staff and gather the assembly you and Aaron your brother and speak to the rock before their eyes and it shall give its water. You shall bring forth for them water from the rock and give drink to the assembly and to their animals. משה took the staff from before Hashem. As he had commanded him. So Chazal here asks, why does it say that Moshe took the staff from before Hashem? Because the staff was not a regular staff like all of the other people had or many of the people had at the time. The staff of Moshe and Aaron were inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. This means, Rabotai, that unlike any other human being in history, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to walk into the Kodesh Kodeshim lehavdi like you walk into your bedroom. We know that a Kohen Gadol who walked into the Kodesh Kodeshim on Yom Kippur, if he has one thought that is inappropriate, and I don't mean a sin, he's simply thinking about is his wife doing well? How are his kids? Uh, he forgot to learn something today. And he's not focusing on what he's supposed to focus on. He dies on the spot. Here we have Moshe Rabbeinu has his staff inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. And Hashem says, go get it from there. Meaning, it's no big deal for Moshe Rabbeinu to go into the Kodesh Kodeshim unlike anybody else. Moshe Rabbeinu brings the staff and the people complain. The people complain and say all types of nasty things showing their lack of emunah in Hashem and his servant Moshe and Moshe says to them Listen, you are rebels. Shall we bring forth from water from this rock? What does it mean, bring forth water from this rock? Chazal says that the people said, No, no, come on. Hashem said, bring water from the rock. Okay, so go, go, just, just, just hit this rock. And he's saying to them, What do you think? I could just pick any rock that I want and not the rock that a Kadosh Baruch Hu said? What do you think? The rock really brings water? Go look at any other rock. Does it bring any water? No. Meaning that in order for me to do this, I have to follow the will of Hashem because Hashem is the one that makes the rock bring the water. Not me. Not the rock. So is there a reality that the wrong rock is something I can choose on my own? No. I have to follow the instructions. Hashem says, go hit the rock. He specifically meant the rock that has been the one that has been bringing the water due to the merit of Miriam. And initially, he spoke to the rock, but he spoke to the wrong rock. And as the people were causing more and more noise, laughing, making fun, complaining, Moshe Rabbeinu hit a rock, and this time he hit the correct rock. But because the rock, in essence the angel that is supervising this rock, knew that the instructions of God was to speak to the rock, not to hit the rock. So the first time he hit it, it didn't yield water. 
Only after the second time did it yield water. That's why it says that Moshe Rabbeinu hit the rock twice. And this Rabotai is one of the fundamental lessons that a person needs to know, especially when they are confused about the basic foundations of Judaism, reward and punishment, the basic foundations of Judaism as far as a sin versus a mitzvah, the basic foundation of Judaism as far as servitude of Hashem because of our need, not His. Here we see that Moshe Rabbeinu hit the rock. Despite the fact that Hashem said, speak to the rock. Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to the wrong rock. And it didn't yield water. So he thought to himself for a moment, oh, so I guess I misunderstood. Because last time Hashem told me to hit the rock. And it yielded water. So this time I spoke to, I thought I understood, speak to the rock. I spoke to it and it didn't yield water. So it must be me. A flaw in me, a mistake in me that I didn't listen correctly. And really, Hashem said to hit the rock, and therefore he hit the rock. But this came out of frustration because of all of the people that were distracting, that were complaining, that were annoying. And Akadosh Baruch's judgment on the tzaddikim is literally. Like the hair breath. He looks at every single thing. And here Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe and Aaron, Yan lo emantim bi Israel. Because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of, of the children of Israel. What? What is he talking to? Korach, Bilam. Lot, who is he talking? Talking to Moshe Rabbeinu. If he didn't believe in Hashem, who does believe in Hashem? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying here, I told you to speak to the rock. You hit the rock. Right there is a mistake, which means that there's a lacking. A lacking. A lacking that has domino effect. What's the domino effect? Had you spoken to the rock instead of hitting the rock, the people would have seen the glory of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and understood once and for all that it is Hashem that brought the water from the rock, not the rock and not anything else. Why? Because the last time you hit the rock and the water came out. 40 years have passed. People can say, listen, he hit the rock in the right place. It's nature and they could philosophize and rationalize however they want. So if you do the same thing again, those philosophers, those heretics, those people looking for an excuse, they have no reason to change. But if you do something different, if you speak to the rock right now, even those loud mouthed people, even those people that are full of philosophy and calculations, even they will be silenced because even they understand that a rock doesn't hear words. So if you spoke to the rock and therefore the rock yielded water, it must be God. And my name will be sanctified even in the eyes of the heretics, in the eyes of the naysayers, in the eyes of the people looking for an excuse. And because you did not hit the rock, because you did not speak to the rock, that opportunity to sanctify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name is lost forever. Certainly there are many opportunities to sanctify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name as the Gemara in Masechet Chayga, Daf Dalet Amud Aleph, page 4a, says, if you did not find a way to sanctify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name today, for what were you created? Meaning we have to look for opportunities to sanctify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name every day, or else we're not fulfilling our purpose. So certainly there are many ways to sanctify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. Get people to do tshuva, get people to learn Torah, get people to do mitzvot. 
plenty of ways to get people to, to, to sanctify Kadosh Bohu's name. But Kadosh Bohu says that particular opportunity to sanctify my name is gone forever. Even though you can sanctify my name five minutes later, five days later, five weeks later, five months later, five years later, five hundred years later. Plenty of ways to sanctify Kadosh Bahu's name. But the significance of Kiddush Hashem is so big that missing one opportunity, one opportunity changes the world forever. One opportunity. Moshe and Aaron did not sanctify Kadosh Bahu's name as a Kadosh Bahu says. You missed the opportunity. For that, there's a domino effect. Had you done it, even the naysayers would have listened, would have done tshuva, you would have entered the land, built the Bet Mikdash, and the climax of the world, the salvation of the world, would have happened right there and then. Death would have stopped forever. War would have stopped forever. No holocaust no pogroms, no inquisitions, no plagues, no black plague, no corona, no corrupt governments, nothing. No anti-Semitism. All of it would have been gone. Why? Moshe Rabbeinu would have built the Bet Mikdash, and that would be it. But now that this opportunity is lost, the domino effect is that the heretics will continue with their heresy, will continue influencing people to go the wrong way. And therefore, eventually lead people to go to complete idolatry. Lead people to murder. Lead people to rape. Lead people to commit adultery. Lead people to say la shonara. Lead people to do all types of things that are against the Torah to the point where HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to destroy the Bet Amikdash not once but twice. And put us in an exile for 2,000 years because of one missed opportunity. Those naysayers are still alive today. Those heretics are still alive today. Those Erevrav are still alive today. Now certainly HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't want Moshe Rabbeinu to have a punishment that doesn't help Am Yisrael. In fact, he specifically chose, as Chazal tell us, he specifically chose not to allow Moshe Rabbeinu to enter Eretz Israel, rather than any other punishment that he could have given him because since HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised Moshe Rabbeinu that everything that he does will be for eternal. Just like the Torah is named after Moshe Rabbeinu, it's eternal, it can never change no matter what people say or do. Anything that Moshe Rabbeinu put his hands on becomes eternal. So had he built the Bet HaMikdash, Hashem couldn't have destroyed it. But since HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw that now that this happened, and the domino effect will eventually lead to more sins that will lead to the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, or many, many sins that would lead to the, the, a, a decree against Am Yisrael, since Moshe Rabbeinu is, if he would be in the picture, Hashem would not be able to destroy the Bet HaMikdash and therefore would have to destroy Am Yisrael Chas Shalom. And therefore, the best gift that he can give to Moshe and to Am Yisrael as a result of this mistake in his level is that he would not let him enter the Eretz Yisrael and therefore not let him build the Bet Mikdash and therefore allow Am Yisrael to make those mistakes but have a way to not be completely destroyed because Hashem destroyed the Bet Mikdash instead of Am Yisrael. So in essence... This is one of the places we see what Rabbi Akiva teaches at the end of Gemara Masechet Brachot that everything that the merciful one does is always for the best. Out of all of the possibilities that we had available to us after this time, after this act, after this missed opportunity, out of all of the possibilities, not allowing Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron to enter Eretz Yisrael was the best possible one. Had they sanctified HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name, then certainly this would not even be an option because it would be ideal for them to build the Bet HaMikdash because the heretics are gone. But because this happened, the, best, the next best opportunity that is now available out of all realm of endless choices that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has is not letting 
משה רבנו אין אהרון אין תארץ ישראל. So here we see how a Kadosh Baruch Hu is critical of his children because our acts are not ours alone. Everything that you do, whether you are 43 years old or 6 years old, whether you are a male or female, a mother or a daughter, whether you are beautiful or ugly, smart or not so much, everything that you do has a domino effect. Similar to what some scientists like to call the butterfly effect, where they are uh, some scientists, which again many dis, uh, disagree with this theory, but some scientists say that when a butterfly flaps its wings, there is a certain amount of current that's uh, that's created from it, or it's an effect that now travels in the air. And it's magnified and magnified and magnified. And over time, it magnifies even more and more and builds more and more. And it could literally lead to a tsunami in China or, or, or Japan or, or some other place. Just one little butterfly. Every butterfly wing, uh, a spread of his wings can affect it. Needless to say, if it's birds, needless to say, if it's a human being doing something, meaning that there is no such thing as I'm here and this only affects me. Everything you do affects the whole world. Especially the Jewish people, everything that you do is a domino effect that not only affects the world, but affects history. This is why the Chovot HaLevavot writes nearly a thousand years ago that even if somebody perfected their character traits and does good deeds like Moshe Rabbeinu, they still will not be in the same level as someone that causes other people to do tshuva. Whether they're causing them to do tshuva by giving speeches like this, or they're causing them to do tshuva by supporting speeches like this, and USBs, and books, and all of the wonderful things that the organization Bezat Hashem does. That person that does kiruv, that supports kiruv, is greater than someone that does good deeds like Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? Because a person that does good deeds, like Moshe Rabbeinu, his act has a domino effect. A domino effect that will affect one person, another person, another person, another person, another person. Whereas a person that helps people do tshuva, his effect is not like one butterfly, but rather a sea of butterflies. Because now... He helped one person do tshuva. That person, every single mitzvah that he does from that day on, whether it's putting on tefillin, eating kosher, doing a blessing, uh, praying, learning Torah, every single thing he ever does, that is creating new effects into the world. He marries a Jewish woman. Now they have a Jewish ceremony. It's another mitzvah. On top of that, they bring children to the world. It's more. Now all of the mitzvot of the entire family, now the family has grown up, those kids are now parents. Now they have kids. Those kids have mitzvot, and so on and so forth. And when a person understands what helping people do tshuva is, they quickly realize why there, there isn't anything else that can compare to it. That's why the chovot alevavot, one of the rishonim, says without skipping a beat, that even if someone learns to lie and does great deeds and perfects his character traits like the prophets and the angels, he's still not going to be in the same caliber as someone that's giving a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, whatever their level is, to its cure of every single month. Why? Because that person that's doing good things, his domino effect is limited to his direct actions. Whereas the person that's helping other people do tshuva through his money or his actions or both, he's literally creating, creating a new community every single day, a new destiny every single day, a new future 
every single day. Just like the story I told you guys last night. Man married with a couple of kids. He's watching the shulim. He's becoming more religious. His wife doesn't like it. Doesn't want it. Doesn't want to keep even family purity. Nothing. Doesn't keep Shabbat. But one day, he reaches out to me and I give him the advice. Watch the personal story with her. Not just send it to her. Watch this other lecture together. She watches it. Now, from the moment she saw that lecture, she decided to take everything on. Modesty, Shabbat, family purity, the kids must go to orthodox religious schools. And on top of it, she now is helping her friends do tshuva. Imagine this. All of those kids that they have together, not just now, but in the future, all of the blessings that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give them, all of them are going to do mitzvot. They're going to marry people. They're going to do mitzvot. They're going to have kids. They're going to do mitzvot. Meaning that movie has now had a domino effect where he gave her that movie. She watched it. Now they have a kosher home that's getting holier and holier by the day. But that changed eternity. It changed eternity because now their eternity is full of mitzvot, full of kedusha, full of chesed full of amazing things for them, for their children, for their grandchildren, for their great-grandchildren. Literally, over a couple of generations, you could literally end up with 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 new direct family members just from them and their kids. Rav Yashiv, when he passed on, left this world, he had 1,000 grandkids, 1,000 descendants in his family. And that's just one generation during his lifetime. Imagine over the next couple of generations. Now, she's helping other people do tshuva. That means she's doing the same thing our husband did for her. She gets one of our friends to do tshuva, her friends and our husband, their kids, that's literally another thousand people. They help another person. It's another thousand people. They help another person. It's another thousand people. Literally, that movie can get... Thousands upon thousands of people to do tshuva just from that single click that happened with this righteous woman and her husband who clearly has a lot of merits in Shemaim because not only is he now yielding or creating more merits but he had to have had some merit in order for that click to work when he sent it and he convinced his wife to watch it. So imagine... Somebody that supports that film. Somebody that supports one of those USBs that we have that has the film. Somebody that supports all of the different lectures. All They get everything that these people are getting. And guess what? This is just one family. Baruch Hashem, we get no ones like this on a daily basis. So when a person calculates how many mitzvot they can do themselves, even if they're literally in a cave all day learning Torah like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, versus how many mitzvot they can get from helping other people do tshuva, there's no comparison whatsoever. So here we see, Rabotai Karim that on the negative end, the domino effect from a lack of Kiddush Hashem, how it affected Klal Yisrael. That lack of Kiddush Hashem, destruction of Bet HaMikdash, destruction of Second Bet HaMikdash, the Holocaust, the the, uh, the pogroms, the inquisitions, anti-Semitism, literally all the tragedies that have happened in the last couple of thousand years. On the other hand, somebody can do something greater than you could ever imagine by helping somebody do tshuva and have much more, 500 times more positive effect with the Kiddush Hashem. What's the greatest Kiddush Hashem? Doing Kiruv. That's the greatest Kiddush Hashem. Why? Because you are sanctifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name by helping other people discover who Hashem is in the first place. Baruch Hashem, there's many other things that we can learn. And I want you guys to ask some questions. The only problem is that we have a uh, problem with this Facebook. 
that uh, it's the way that I get these questions. So let's see if uh, I could uh, somehow get your questions. If you guys maybe could send me the questions via WhatsApp. I'll read some questions that are already on. See if, and then, uh, if there's any more, anybody that wants to send it, send it via WhatsApp. Or you can send it directly to my Facebook uh, direct page because I can't reconnect it to the camera right now. All right, let's see. What is the polite, diplomatic, politically correct way to let friends and family know that one cannot attend a non-sniut mixed dancing event that we are invited to without putting down or insulting those that do not follow and possibly even understand or after explaining why? We may not agree. Okay, so there is no politically correct way to do it if you're going to do it the right way. Meaning, if one of your family members, friends, or whoever is asking you to come to a mixed dancing type of wedding, bar mitzvah, or any type of event, if you're going to tell them the truth, there is no political correct way of saying the truth. Now, you can do it one of two ways. You could simply say, I'm sorry, but uh, I can't go. Oh, how can you not go? No, I just that uh, on that day, I have a, uh, uh, you know, an appointment, I have a meeting, I have this, I have that. You can, so many words you can say that uh, you simply can't attend. That way you'll avoid all altercation. It's not the ideal way, but it's certainly a uh, way to avoid the uh, uh, discussion. On the other hand, if you want to tell them the truth... You don't have to yell at them or mock them, but you have to tell them that according to our Torah, we are not allowed to go to a place where men and women are dancing together because it's considered inappropriate and immodest. And therefore, Hashem is not going to be in such a place, and I'm not allowed to be in such a place. So this is simply what the Torah says. We learn it, the source for it is actually next week's parasha, which in Israel is this week's parasha, parashat Balak, where at the end of the parasha, we uh, see that Balak tells uh, Bilam, uh, I'm sorry, Bilam tells uh, Balak that Hashem hates Zima, Hashem hates immorality. And the uh, Sefer Hasidim says that anytime people have mixed dancing events, there are demons that are created in those places that go home with those people and cause all types of tragedies in their lives. So the point is, is that we're not allowed to go to such places. And since I don't want to be punished by Hashem, I don't want to go against Hashem. Uh, I don't want to disrespect Hashem. I cannot go to such a party. The end. That is the correct way of seeing it. And uh, that is the uh, way that you should say it. But if you don't want to tell them the truth, you want them to go to Ganom, you want them to uh, uh, stay ignorant for the rest of their life, you want to see them burn in Ganom uh, because uh, uh, they, you did not give them the information, then by all means, don't tell them. Tell them that you can't go and tell them that, uh, you know, that uh, that's it. That, uh, you know, enjoy, have a good time. So in so many words... They're going to have a religious person. Tell them, have a good time. I can't go, but you have a good time. Mazel tov. So in so many words, they're not going to learn the truth from a religious person. And uh, they're going to go on with their life and uh, feel like they're doing a mitzvah because they're having a wedding. After all, it's a Jewish wedding. So if you have no problem seeing people burn and melt and suffer uh, 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 during their life and after, then certainly you can avoid telling them the truth. But if you do care about them, then you should tell them Jews are not allowed to go to such events. They're not allowed to have such events. And if they disagree with you, you could simply say, you're not disagreeing with me, but you're disagreeing with the Torah. And if they say, no, but there are some rabbis that are coming to the event. And you could tell them, well, the Torah says it's forbidden both for regular people and for rabbis. And if somebody is going there, obviously they're violating the Torah regardless of where the, whether they are a rabbi or not because even Korach was a rabbi and he's in Gainon till this day. And that way, these people can at the very least have some sense of truth told to them that could potentially change their mind. It may not change their mind, but it's certainly going to affect their neshama in one way or another. But if you don't care about them and you just prefer for them to burn in Gainon, then by all means, don't tell them. Uh, let's see. 
Is a Jew allowed to inform or complain to an insurance company if a Jewish dentist is not billing correctly or overcharging a Jewish patient? Uh, no, you're not allowed to go and uh, complain to, uh, 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 to a, some type of entity about somebody. You have to go to that uh, Jewish dentist and tell them that there is the wrong uh, uh, billing, there's the wrong uh, charge, and if they do not want to uh, um, correct it, then you can go and take them to a beddin. Take them to a beddin, and uh, if they don't want to attend the beddin, then they would go, you know, they'll be put on cherem. But you can get a permission from the beddin at that point to either go to the insurance company or to uh, file a lawsuit or something else. But in order to go to a, uh, someone outside of the Bedin, you have to get permission from the Bedin. Because anyone that goes to the government or, 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 or to any type of entity that could hurt a Jew is considered a Mosel. And a Mosel is a person that is, uh, you know, is... is, is Excluded from Am Yisrael. It's a horrible uh, decree. So you can't just simply go against Jews. Uh, you have to uh, get a permission from a Bedin first. But again, I assume that if you go to a dentist uh, that's in business and cares about his business, you complain about the charges. Uh, more times than not, they're going to change it. Not necessarily because they always agree with you, but simply because they don't want the headache. Can I ask a non-Jewish home or health aid to turn off the air conditioning in my father's bedroom if it's too cold for him on Shabbat. Uh, well, I mean, this is a, again, this is a problem with a, uh, telling a, uh, 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 a uh, non-Jew to do something directly uh, is problematic. What you can do is you can already tell them uh, ahead of time to make sure that uh, before Shabbat, to make sure that the house is always comfortable for them it's not too cold it's not too hot and if she hears or he hears that the uh uh the father or whoever the patient is is cold then to lower the temperature on their own without them being said telling them directly to uh, uh to lower the temperature so you could do that you could in essence inform them to uh be more uh, uh conscious of the uh temperature in the room and uh conscious of, the, of how uh, your father feels, but to go and tell him directly to lower the temperature is problematic. What's the meaning of teeth falling in a, out in a dream? It depends which teeth. The most, uh, the Shukhan Aruch says that when a person has uh, teeth fallen, uh, completely falling out in a dream, it's considered a dangerous dream, especially if the teeth that fell are the back teeth, the molars. Uh, that uh, usually means that someone is going to die. Uh, and typically when a person has such a dream, they should uh, e uh, fast or give tzedakah or both. Uh, you know, it's, a, uh, it's, uh, it's in essence a, it's a, it's a terrible message. May I purchase Barbie dolls for my young cousins even though most of the Barbie dolls are not just sniut? If you want to go to Gay Nome and you want your, your cousins to go to Gay Nome too, then by all means buy Barbie dolls and all of the things that are against uh, the Torah and uh, teach people that uh, it's okay to be immodest. But if you want to go to Gan Eden, which I know you do, uh, and you want them to learn that uh, Barbie dolls are not good toys and in fact are forbidden for Jews to have because they're immodest and they are... Uh, teaching to be immodest, and in fact, some of the dolls today are complete, you know, the homosexuals and LGBTQ garbage, so certainly no Jew should buy these dolls. Uh, these dolls are certainly uh, not uh, for Klal Israel. Anyone that cares about Hashem is not going to be involved in anything that's directly offensive uh, to Hashem and His Torah, uh, which means immodest dolls, immodest clothes, immodest movies, immodest shows, Anything that has immodesty is forbidden for Klal Yisrael to be involved with in any way, shape, or form. It's also forbidden for a Jew to be involved in immodest clothing as a, as a business. You know, there are many Jews, unfortunately, in the, in the apparel business, and unfortunately, many of them are selling immodest clothes. In so many words, they're causing people to sin. So they have a very, very serious problem in Shemaim uh, when they get up there because they're causing the public to sin. So it's, it's, it's forbidden for a Jew to be involved in any of these businesses. Uh, if a parent of yours has a picture of, of the idol of Christianity at their house, 
would it be a mitzvah to take it and destroy it without permission, just as Avram destroyed his father's idols, or would that be dishonoring your parents uh, by doing something against their will? If it's their house and not your house, uh, then you can't just go into their house and take their property. Uh, but if it's in your house, you could take it and, 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 uh, and destroy it. Uh, but uh, as far as just going to somebody's house and, and take their property, though, you can't do that. If it's public property, for example, if there is a uh, immodest picture on, uh, on, on, uh, that somebody put on some pole, uh, then you could uh, take it off and, and destroy it, even on Shabbat. But, uh, but if, it's a, if it's something that belongs to somebody, you can't just decide to take their property. No. Uh, what type of, uh, of appro- what type of or appropriate prayer would you say for every sick or elderly person whose quality of life is gone? Uh, what prayer you would, uh, f- you know, first and foremost, you pray for them to have refuah lima. Uh, now, even though you, you know, the uh, the person is elderly or is very very sick, and uh, people are saying this is chronic condition, it's only chronic and and, and permanent according to the doctors. It doesn't necessarily need to be chronic according to Hashem. Chizkiyahu uh, was a uh, on his deathbed, uh, but uh, as soon as he found out that uh, he's being punished and to die. Because he made a mistake by uh, uh, seeing Beruach HaKodesh that he's going to have sons that uh, were heretics and therefore he decided not to get married. Uh, you know, and so he, uh, he thought that he was doing good. But the prophet Yeshaya, the prophet Isaiah came to him and told him this, uh, that this is the reason why he's dying. So as soon as he realized his mistake, he said, okay, I do tshuva, I'm sorry. Tell, you know, I tell Hashem I'm sorry and I'll, I'll get married right away. I'll marry your daughter if you allow me. And Hashem accepted his tshuva and miraculously uh, uh, recovered him. He went from being on a deathbed to being completely healthy. So certainly, uh, there is no limitation that Hashem has, as we learned from the Torah a couple of weeks ago, Ayad Hashem Tiktsar, that Hashem's hand is not shorthanded, meaning that He can do anything. So you should always pray for their refuah shlema, always. Second thing you should pray is for them to have refuah nefesh and refuah taguf, that they would have complete uh, uh, cure for the uh, for the body and the soul, meaning that they will do tshuva, that they will get closer to Hashem, that they will see good and chesed even through the difficulties. These are the things you could certainly uh, pray for them, especially the refuat and nefesh, because once a person's nefesh, once a person's soul uh, is is healed, even if they're dealing with difficulty and pain and agony and, and they're bleeding from all types of places and they have nerve pain everywhere, but they see the good in it, they see the chesed in it, they see the love through the pain, this person is better than cured. Why? Because this person knows that it's Hashem helping him or helping her even through the pain. That is greater than any physical cure that one can get. Okay, is it proper to bite into... Is it proper to bite into a f- piece of food, like an animal, pizza or a sandwich, or is it better to tear small pieces? Uh, you know, there are certain foods that certainly you have to eat them that way, and there are certain foods that you have to eat them uh, with a fork and knife. It all depends. It also depends on the setting, where you are at. Uh, if you are at a, in the middle of the street, whether you're eating with a fork and knife or... Uh, or you're eating or you're biting into it, it's inappropriate. But if you are in your house or you are at a restaurant where people eat, uh, then whatever way is the appropriate way to eat, uh, certainly you should eat. But again, make sure that uh, it's, uh, uh, you're not disgusting. You know, there's certain things, there's certain foods that the only way to eat them is in a disgusting way because of the food or the, uh, uh, the, the, the way that certain people think that they can just do whatever they want. So again, always be polite within... Uh, your best, and you'll be fine. Okay, that's up to there is all the message I got from Facebook. Let's see if I have... If I take pictures of my parent posing in not the ideal mother's clothing, she asked me to do it, and she posts it, and my partner in the sin, 
um, it's not the ideal thing to have on your account. Put it that way. It all, you know, it's not the ideal thing to have in your account. Uh, next, uh, is a Jew allowed to donate plasma, part of their blood, if it's uh, to help people, uh, they're still getting money for it, uh, or do we need to keep the good juice God gave us since we don't know what kind of people the medicine will uh, potentially help? Uh, it is certainly a mitzvah to donate uh, blood. In fact, you could donate a kidney uh, even uh, because a, a person can uh, live uh, with one kidney. There's actually a Jewish organization that uh, is, uh, was set up in order to uh, uh, match Jews with Jews. Uh, they, uh, they, you know, they take care of, you know, if, if one person wants to donate his kidney to save the life uh, of another Jew, they try to make the match and try to match Jews with, uh, with each other. Uh, again, sometimes obviously it's going to be Jews with non-Jews, but the point being is, is that to donate uh, a kidney is allowed, needless to say, donating blood is allowed. Uh, and in fact, the, the first blood bank uh, that was opened in Eretz Yisrael was opened, was uh, built by Arav Aaron Zev's father, you know, our dear Arav uh, Zev from Staten Island. He comes from a very Hashub family, uh, connected to the Ben Ishchai, to connected to uh, 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 Rav Kaduri, uh, and uh, he actually, his father built the first blood bank, and the reason why he built it is because in those days, many women were dying uh, uh, as uh, during uh, delivering of the baby, because so much blood came out, and they didn't have uh, a, a blood bank in those times, and many women would simply die from just uh, regular birth. You know that you know that uh, had minor complications, and sometimes not even. So having a, a blood bank is very very important, and certainly having a uh, uh, blood of righteous people. Uh, is uh, certainly a good thing because it could actually help the person in more ways than just uh, uh, his body. It could also help him in his, uh, in his neshama. If you're a righteous person, you're giving uh, blood, that's uh, it's a good thing. Again, don't put yourself in harm's way and uh, obviously the, uh, uh, you know, take care of your own health. But the point being is, is that it's certainly a mitzvah to uh, donate uh, blood. As far as who the blood ends up with, that's uh, not uh, your problem to manage. It's your problem to, uh, uh, to work on before you donate the blood. Meaning, the more righteous you are, the more Hashem is going to direct the, uh, uh, the things that you give. Whether you give money as tzedakah, or you give blood, or anything that you do, the more Hashem is going to direct the fruits of your labor to end up in the right places. Jeremiah the prophet uh, pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to punish the sinners with directing their, their charitable uh, 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 giving to bad people. That they wouldn't even have the merit uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, the, the good that they're trying to do because they're, you know, they're, they're bad people. So that was actually one of the curses. Uh, and uh, the prophet Jeremiah uh, literally uh, prayed to Hashem to punish the people because they were so wicked. Uh, the ones that he was speaking about, that uh, he didn't want them to have any merits whatsoever. So the point is, is that from there we learn that the fruits of our labor, the fruits of our, our teaching, the fruits of our giving, uh, is all based on our actions. If we are righteous, Hashem will direct everything that we do to good people. If we are wicked, Hashem will direct everything we do to wicked people. For example, you'll see that there are many people donating money to different organizations. And many times those organizations are not doing the right thing. They're telling people God needs you. They're telling people that uh, uh, the, the rabbi that died is, is, is really God or he's the Mashiach. They're telling people the wrong thing. But yet you see those, those organizations get literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So why, why is Hashem sending them so money? Because the people that are giving to those organizations are wicked themselves. They don't deserve to give their money to good organizations. They deserve to give it to an organization that's going to waste the money. Just to a couple of days ago, uh, somebody, uh, Talmit Chacham, sent me a website of an organization that is uh, writing Sifret Torah. Now this particular organization, I don't have to necessarily mention the name, uh, this organization literally teaches lies left and right. 
but they've already raised enough money to write eight Sifret Torah. What do you need eight Sifret Torah for? Even if you have a huge shul with a thousand people, you still don't need eight Sifret Torah. But they've already gotten donations for eight Sifret Torah and they're on a, uh, they're, they're about uh, 20% away from the ninth one. No, so that means people donated hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions already, for just for Sifret Torah. For what? For an organization that already has more than they need, an organization that teaches things that are the opposite of the Torah, an organization that literally is full of wicked people. So why did Hashem allow this? Because those people that donated didn't deserve to have their money go to a place that actually is going to use a Sefer Torah for the right reasons. And the same goes with a lot of other organizations that are getting millions of dollars, whether those organizations are uh, Jews or different uh, or idol worshipers. If the organization is wicked and people are donating to them, that doesn't only speak uh, about the organization, it speaks about the donor's status. The donor status, the donor that's donating to a wicked organization, that's in essence Hashem telling you, you, I don't want your money. I don't want your money. That's, that's in essence the curse of, of Jeremiah the prophet. So it's important for people to know that if you donated money then to, to a righteous cause, especially to Kiruv, to things that actually are supposed to help other people do tshuva, and your life hasn't improved you know over a period of several years you're consistently doing it that nothing has happened in your life in fact things have gotten worse something is wrong why because when you are partners with Hashem there are always going to be different obstacles but life in general gets better life gets better there's more panasa there's more money there's more kids there's more love in the house there's more kedusha there's more blessing if you're not seeing blessing there's something wrong I know somebody that uh, donated a bunch of money to an organization. Uh, an organization is a good organization. Good organization. They do some good things. And uh, at least the ones that I know of. And uh, anyway, donated a bunch of money to sponsor a uh, sponsor uh, books. And uh, he, uh, you know, he donated his money. They, uh, I guess they gave out some books and they gave him some books. They gave him some books. Now, these books are good. But he decided that, uh, you know, uh, he, you know that's, he can't really handle this big donation because he had some financial troubles. The test came up. After he donated, things turned around. And he wasn't in a good financial situation. So what did he decide to do? He decided to sell the books. Decided to sell the books. And uh, instead of him getting a blessing out of, uh, out of uh, doing this Kiru, doing this thing that's going to help people, his financial situation continued to de- uh, deteriorate already for the last maybe 10 years. Think about it. He made, made a huge donation to help people do tshuva. And his life went downhill from that moment. Now, automatically we think it's the organization's fault. But in this case, I personally know it's not. At least, not all of it. Why? Because he didn't really donate anymore. He decided to sell the books. Once you decide to sell this stuff, now it's a business. Now it's a business. So, once you decide to be a partner with Hashem, you have to trust Hashem 100%. You have to trust Hashem 100%. The more you trust Hashem, the more Hashem is going to give you blessings. Once you trust Hashem, the less you trust Hashem, the less blessings you get. So, that's also something that people need to understand. Uh, next is a uh, oh the same question again. Okay. Is there malbin pnechavero berabim for Gentiles? And in a previous lecture, you mentioned that Satan and his wife having shlombite issues. Please elaborate. Okay, these are two big questions. Uh, so as far as for Gentiles, no, there isn't. Uh, the uh, seven Noahide laws and other ethical laws do not uh, have uh, this uh, in it. Certainly it's not good to do. Certainly it's unethical to, to do such things, but it's not in the same category as the seven Noahide laws. Uh, the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin goes into details of the seven Noahide laws. The Rambam uh, also in Ilchot Melachim goes into the seven Noahide laws. 
Uh, certainly the uh, Gentiles have to be moral and have to be decent with each other. They're not allowed to commit adultery, steal each other's wives, uh, steal, uh, rape, homosexuality is forbidden, obviously idolatry is forbidden. But uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the details of uh, um, uh, the things that uh, are punishable by uh, heaven are uh, not uh, relevant to them. Meaning that, uh, you know, a Jew that, uh, uh, you know, that embarrasses another Jew in public doesn't get punished by a Bedin. He gets punished by heaven. So those uh, are uh, not relevant to the, uh, the Gentiles uh, in this particular case. Uh, as far as the, uh, the Satan and his wife having Shalom Bayit problems, as I said yesterday or whenever I said it, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, she is a, uh, you know, she left, Adam, she was originally married to Adam Rishon. Uh, she was married to Adam Rishon and uh, she was created from Afar, just like Adam Rishon was. Uh, and uh, because she was made from Afar, uh, she didn't want to uh, follow Adam. Uh, when Adam, Adam wanted to be intimate with her, she did not want to follow his uh, preference. Uh, he said that it's naturally, you're, uh, the, the man is supposed to be on top, and she didn't want it, and uh, she didn't want to listen to him, and she ran away from him. And the, uh, and the Zohar says that uh, she went to Yamsuf. She went to Yamsuf, and Adam Rishon cried out to Hashem and uh, said that uh, uh, the woman that you gave me left. And uh, Hashem said to the angels, go after her and tell her that if she, uh, if she doesn't uh, uh, come back, then uh, she'll be punished to have a hundred of our kids die every day. So the angels came and saw, you know, brought, came to the Yam Suf, and um, uh, over there, she they told her to come back, and she said, "I'm not coming back. I don't want to be under him." They said, "Listen, God said that if you don't come back, you'll be punished." And initially, she thought she was considering coming back, but in the last minute, she decided otherwise. She decided to uh, run away, and for that. Uh, every day she uh, gives birth to a hundred uh, demons and sees them uh, destroyed uh, and uh, suffers that. Now, where do these things come from? Where does this pregnancy come from? It comes from wasted seed. Anytime a man wastes seed, that seed in essence gives her, gives birth to things that she creates that come out of her. And there is a fight, a constant fight between her and him. Uh, she is uh, more powerful in certain regards uh, than he is, uh, and uh, and she has a whole. Uh, she cheats on him in so many words. She, <laughs> so uh, there's there's more details, but I think that you guys got enough already for that. I know it's interesting, but we have to uh, move on to things that are a little bit uh, uh, something else. Let's just go there. Um. All right. Uh, thank you for making you. How to save my younger sister when parents are pushing their lefty liberal feminist ideologies and brainwash her to become a swimming athlete. They are firm atheists and don't speak much English. Uh, well, I mean, the number one ways to help people, to help people is number one is to give them our lectures to watch. Send them the personal story, that uh, same story that saved that entire family and pretty much everyone that they know that they're going to give that lecture to, that movie to, uh, and many, many other people. Send them the movie, Hashem Took Back His Millions. Watch it with them if, 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 if possible, if they're close to you. So it's like a, uh, they feel like you're together with them. It's, uh, it's rather than, you know, watch it on their own. Uh, after that, you know, watch other lectures with them, send them lectures, educate them that way rather than speak to them about it. Because if they watch one of our lectures, they're not only uh, uh, going to be uh, educated, but they're also going to feel comfortable to apply some of these things because they're not feeling like somebody's talking down to them that's uh, like a family member or a friend, you know, because they're listening to somebody in the video. So many times people uh, are not willing to listen to their friends or family uh, rebuking them or telling them that they need to do tshuva because of their ego. Uh, so, but when it comes from somebody like myself that's on a screen or if you see me in a live lecture one day 
it's much easier for people to take it on because they know that it's 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 coming from a somebody that doesn't even know them, uh, and and they feel like they're 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 in essence choosing to follow what they learned rather than choosing to follow what somebody told them to do. So, if you share the lectures with them, that's certainly going to uh, help them. Be consistent with it. Be patient with it. Uh, don't. Uh, 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 you know, yell at them or criticize them for not watching. Just be consistent. Keep trying. Second thing is also lead by example. The more, uh, the better you become, the better you behave, the better your character traits are, the better your life becomes, the uh, people are going to see it and they're going to take notice. And many times they're going to want to do the same thing. And if they, if you, uh, if you're welcoming, eventually they're going to ask you for a favor. I can tell you, uh, you know, personal experience. I have somebody that I uh, is very, very close to me. That uh, for years, for years, I tried to uh, to help this person, uh, teach this person, call this person. You know, anytime I had a chance, anytime I would see them, uh, I'd spend some time with them to try to get them to keep Shabbat. Uh, get them to uh, listen to the lectures, and it simply never worked. It just simply never worked. Now, I tried and tried and tried, but uh, it just simply never worked. But one thing I did is I never closed the door. I never yelled at them to uh, tell them, listen, if you don't listen to me, then such and such. No, I simply, you know, I continued trying to influence them, to help them, to teach them, to guide them, to uh, be understanding, uh, you know, that I, I used to be in the same place. Long story short, the, uh, they saw my life and how at one point it was terrible and Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a lot of blessings and my wife and I with our kids and our life and all the things that we do and it's very clear for anyone that uh, you know, knows me personally, anyone that uh, uh, is, is let's say in the circle, uh, which is very, very small circle I could say, uh, that sees my life, you know, firsthand, sees literally, it's, it's a miraculous life, Baruch Hashem. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's, there's, there's amazing things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us, and we live on a miracle, we, we, we love the miracle, we love the Torah, we are celebrating it, so everyone that sees how our life is, and how literally HaKadosh Baruch Hu is babysitting us every single day, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's impossible to miss. So everyone wants that. Everyone wants that. People, I have even have some of my uh, 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 colleagues from Wall Street uh, contact me from, from time to time. Just a few days ago, uh, one of the guys I worked with 20-something years ago uh, you know, reached out to me saying, hey, listen, I, I see your videos. He's not even Jewish. He's a Muslim guy, but he's watching my videos once in a while. He's impressed with them. So the point is, is that People see, and it's not just if you have videos. It's simply if you have a good life, you do. If you sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name, other people will take notice, and they'll be interested in doing it. But unless you keep an open door, where you're trying to, you know, you're you're always honest. You're never uh, telling them it's okay to sin or it's okay to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, desecrate Hashem's name. You never tell them it's okay. You always tell them, listen, this is the law. You do whatever you want, but this is what the law is. This is what the truth is. You do what you're doing, you're going to get punished. But I- I'm telling you this because I love you, not because I don't love you. So you never change the truth for anybody. You never customize the truth in, in new forms. You simply tell people what it is, but you say it with, a, with love, with passion, with compassion. And you keep that door open with them. And guess what? One day, when they see enough good that they, 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 they and they're interested in it, their spark is, is, is turned on, they're going to call you. They're going to text you. They're going to say, listen, uh, can you recommend a book? Can you recommend a lecture? Can you recommend such and such? And that's your door. And you go on that horse and you try to help them as much as possible. And you tell them, listen, yeah, sure. I got books. In fact, you know what? I even have an extra book I'm going to send you. And even if you don't have it, if you have 20 bucks, buy them the book and go give it to them. Be a partner in their tshuva. Answer their questions anytime you need something. Be welcoming and so on. But again, it's, a, it's, it's all based on how you manage your life. If you're the type of person that is befriending everybody and accepting everything that they do no matter what without a rebuke, then no one is ever going to change because of that. No one will ever do tshuva because you're accepting them under all conditions. But people will do tshuva if you tell them the truth and you give them a rebuke from compassion rather from criticism 
and uh, you try to help them, but at the same token, even if they're not accepting your help, you're still offering it. You're still, you know, you still have your hand out. And one day, this particular person, literally 10 years, I tried to help this person or, you know, a long time. I think it was almost 10 years. And one day, this person reached out to me and uh, said, listen, I have this situation. I wanted to ask you a question about it. And before you know it, I started giving this person material in Baruch Hashem. And uh, the last uh, year, this person has completely transformed their life. Completely transformed their life. They're keeping Shabbat. They're keeping kosher. They're learning Torah. Literally. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I tried everything for years. Nothing worked. But keeping that door open and caring about the person still made that, uh, that possible. Why? Because if you criticize people and, and you simply tell them uh, things as if you're better and they're not and, and it comes from ego, then even if they want to change, they're not going to want to come to you because they you know they feel embarrassed coming to you as if like you're right and they're wrong but if you do with compassion and care when they're ready to change they will come to you how do you do with compassion and care simply do it consistently do it with with a lot of patience understanding uh don't uh give up on them don't get frustrated with them uh even if you're frustrated keep that frustration to yourself and uh, pray pray for them pray for them and uh, the more you care about them the more you pray for them and that's the way you can help your sister and anybody else that you care about. Uh, my son wants to ask, why are there different types of fires? So the Gemara says that the different type of fires, uh, because each one of those fires has different purposes. There's a fire for this world, for example, uh, but there's also the, the fire of the, uh, uh, that Eliyahu and Navi used. That is the, uh, a fire that consumed things that the regular fire can't consume. So each one of these fires has a different role. Just like you have uh, uh, Havdil, you have different types of nails and screws. Uh, why can't everybody use the same screw or the same nail? Because different things need different uh, uh, things. You know, if, you have, if you're building a toy, usually you'll need small little screws. If you're building uh, some type of a, uh, electronic... Uh, then it's even smaller screws. On the other hand, if you're building something that's a uh, much bigger, you're building, let's say, a car, then of course the screws have to be much bigger. Uh, if you're building a bridge, then each one of these screws, literally one screw, uh, could be anywhere from uh, five, six pounds to uh, as much as, uh, you know, 100 pounds, depending on, 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 on where in, in this thing is going. So just like there are different screws, there are different nails, there are different types of wood, there are different types of everything is because there's different uses. So Hashem uses the different fires for different things. And the Gemara goes into uh, 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 some details about some of the fires of what they're used for. For example, the fire that Eliyahu and Avi uh, used at the, uh, when it was uh, the battle against the, uh, the, uh, the, the 450 false prophets uh, that fire consumed the sacrifice which was the cow the uh uh, uh the the um uh um the place that uh, was uh, it was on top the stone the water and even the ground it was obviously a heavenly fire so a regular fire cannot do such a thing especially not instantly so different fires have different uses Uh, how can a person go about getting his wife to wear a mitpachat and not a wig, even though she is aware of the Abu Dazara? A uh, couple of things. Number one, the more a wife you know, knows that her husband believes and feels and expresses how beautiful she is, the more she will want to do what he wants when it comes to modesty. If the husband is constantly giving his wife extraordinary compliments when she is wearing a mitpachat, but does not give these compliments when she's wearing a wig, then of course the wife is going to pay attention to this. If he tells her, listen, I love you in a, uh, either way, but when you're wearing a mitpachat, you look much holier, much more beautiful. It's much more attractive to me. I absolutely love it. Whereas when you're wearing somebody else's hair, it's just it's strange to me. It's not yours. 
uh, you know, you're always beautiful, but it's just uh, to me, I prefer the mitpachat. And he's constantly uh, 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 generous with compliments all the time. It always tells how beautiful she is and buys her presents that he can afford. And usually the best presents are words. The more she feels beautiful in the eyes of her husband, the more she will want to be modest. The more she uh, uh, feels like he's looking at other women and he doesn't give her enough compliments, then guess what? She's going to look for those compliments from other people. So this is actually something we talked about in the Jewish Intimacy series last night. So this came out today on YouTube. Highly recommended for all husbands. All husbands to uh, watch the Jewish Intimacy lecture from last night. It's Jewish Intimacy number 30. Uh, and it talks literally about this particular subject. Uh, so uh, highly recommend for all husbands to, to watch that lecture because many times husbands think that their, their wives are rebelling against them. It, the truth is, is that the, the wife is a mirror. The wife is a mirror of who, where you stand. Ezer ke negdo. She's, uh, the, the sages say she's either Ezer, she's either helpful, or she's negdo, or she's against him, based on his actions. If you are doing the will of Hashem, your wife will be Ezer. She'll be with you, help you. If you're doing things that are against Hashem, she's going to be negdo. She's going to go against you. So the more a husband is generous with compliments, with money, if he, if he has money, uh, meaning the more he's generous, the more he's loving, the more he expresses that love, the more the wife feels love, the more she will want to do the will of her husband. The more a wife feels lonely, the more she's going to look for affection from other places. Uh, this is the number one reason of why women dress immodestly, even if they're married with kids. Uh, this is the number one reason why women cheat on their husbands. This is the number one reason why women have all types of uh, friends that are inappropriate uh, because they're looking for attention and affection from somewhere and they're not getting it from their husband. And this is a mistake that uh, husbands simply don't realize. They think, oh, listen, if I'm religious, then my, my wife is just going to listen to me. She does not a ro- she's not a robot. She's not a robot. She's, she's, uh, she's, she, she still needs love. She still needs affection. She still needs compliments. And if you're stingy with those things, then guess what? She's going to get them somewhere. She's going to get them somewhere. Some of the dumbest husbands uh, that uh, I've ever met uh, not only knew that their wives were unhappy, but they simply refused to change. The wife would complain, listen, honey, you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're not paying attention to me. Okay, fine, listen, when I get time. Yeah, but I need attention now. I need attention at some point in the near future. Yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm learning. Or I'm uh, going to shiur. Okay, fine, go to shiur. But after the shiur, tomorrow when you don't have a shiur, at some point, and that's the problem. Sometimes husbands don't get the message. And they simply don't care. And, that's, uh, and then they, they're surprised that their wives cheat on them. Or their wives simply one day want a divorce. Divorces don't happen for no reason. Women, naturally, their inclination is to be with the person they were intimate with, especially if it's their first. They're not, in, they're not women are not like uh, men, where uh, men want more and more many times, even if it's a, uh, you know, it's somebody that's not their wife. Women, generally speaking, normal women I'm talking about, they're content with being with the same person for their whole life, as long as they're getting the love and affection that they, that, that they need. Now, of course, some women are a little too needy, and, uh, and, and, and it's, uh, you can never satiate them, but I'm talking about, generally speaking, the norm. And the norm is that if a husband is generous with their compliments, generous with their money, generous with their time when they have it, even if they spend once a week with their, with their wife, uh, they have a uh, time they spend with their wife, that could, sometimes some women it will be more than enough for her. Other women need, I don't know, half hour a day. Some women say, no, no, I want my husband to be with me uh, two, three hours a day. Then probably you and your husband are going to go to Gainom because if he's with you two, three hours a day, there's no time for him to learn Torah. But spend a half hour a day, you know, no problem. You know, spend a uh, time each week, have one day that's a little longer, no problem. But again, a husband thinking that his wife is just simply, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's next to her. But he's watching TV. He's next to her, but he's playing on a computer. He's next to her, but he's talking to his friends. And he thinks that's the same thing? It's not. It's not. Him saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you look okay. You look good. He thinks that's a compliment? It's not. Saying you look okay is not a compliment. Even saying you look good is not a compliment. 
Everything has to be extra. If she likes flowers, buy her flowers. She likes a, uh, whatever she likes, buy her. Be generous with your wife. A, uh, husbands that are stingy with their wives typically end up with divorces. Why? Because, again, the, uh, the, the wives, uh, they need, this is uh, for them, when their uh, husbands are stingy with them, to them that means they don't love them. Now, again, a, uh, if a person is struggling to make ends meet, they're thinking, listen, what, so if I don't buy my wife presents, I'm she's going to divorce me? No. She obviously knows if you can't make ends meet. If you don't have money to, to put food on the table, if you have a normal wife, your wife doesn't care about you buying new presents. But you can still be generous with your words. You can still be generous with, uh, with, with affection. So again, it's a, uh, guys forget that the longer you're married, the more your wife needs to, to feel that, uh, that, uh, that you're with her. Many times guys exert all of the affection in the world at the beginning of a relationship. You know, the, I love you, I miss you. They text her 57 times a day. They, uh, they uh, keep the pictures on the phone. And that's during the first few months that they know each other. But then... After uh, a couple of years, all of a sudden it's like, hey, what's up? What's up? Okay, I'll talk to you next week. And it's like they barely talk to each other. That's not good. You have to constantly, you know, keep that relationship fresh. And you have to constantly uh, compliment each other. Uh, the wife has to compliment the husband. The, wife, the husband has to compliment the wife. You have to be generous with each other. You have to love each other. You have to be affectionate. Uh, and uh, it's a, if you do all of those things, your wife will do what you wanted to do, which includes removing a wig or immodesty or anything like that. If your wife does not want to remove the wig, that's because she's unhappy with you. Even if she doesn't tell you that. Even if she tells you, no, 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 it's because of my job. No, 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 it's because of uh, my friends. No, no, it's not because. It's, 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 she may say it's because of her friends, but it's because... Her friends are who she gets attention from. If she got the attention from you, she wouldn't care what her friends think. She wouldn't even need friends. In fact, many times I tell people, women ask me sometimes uh, if they should uh, get more friends. And, you know, I generally tell people that, you, you, you know, for women to have friends is usually more problematic than, than, uh, than, uh, than it needs to be. Women, generally speaking, uh, don't do many good things with their friends. Let's just say that. It's, if they talk a lot, it's usually Lashon uh, And if they go to different places, then usually it's not always the best places. So having friends is not necessarily the ideal thing for a woman. But sometimes a woman needs a friend because the husband doesn't want to be next to her. So it's, it's, it's very problematic. Uh, but they, uh, if the husband is giving her the attention that she needs, she will not need friends. She will not need anything. She'll be con completely content with her husband and kids. But if she is not getting the affection from uh, the, the, the place that she's supposed to, she will look for it elsewhere, even if that means other men. Even if that means other men, even if that means somebody on the internet, even, you know, there's unfortunately several times I've had women uh, come to me for help and I would find out that they're literally cheating on their husbands with everything except, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes it was too far, but with, generally speaking, they would usually tell me before it's too late. They're cheating on their husbands with talking to another guy, expressing uh, affection with another guy, just everything except the, the, the body. You know, they have this relationship with them on the internet or on the phone or phone calls, emails, and literally they have this whole relationship, sometimes for years. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, they come to me and I try to get them out of it and many times I succeed doing it. And, uh, but what ruins it many times is that the husbands are stupid. The husbands are stupid. The husbands like, see, the wife is, you know, all of a sudden trying to give him more attention. All of a sudden is more patient. All of a sudden is like, you know, more of a wife. But the husband doesn't get the message. Doesn't get the message and he doesn't change. And, you know, and sometimes it happens where the woman says, okay, you know what? I give up. I've had, I've had a situation where I, uh, there was one, you know, one particular husband that uh, literally, I don't think there's another stupid guy on, on earth that's stupid than him. He, you know, he claims to be a, you know, learning Torah and, and, and doing good things, but he's literally, uh, he's better off not learning Torah. He's better off going to business. He's better off doing anything but what he's doing right now because whatever he's doing is not working. He's just, he does everything possible to make everyone feels bad, no matter what they do. You know, it's a, uh, at one point, his, his wife didn't even want to be together with him at all. 
And, you know, it's a, uh, I literally convinced her that this is, ne- this is necessary for a relationship. She was willing to do it. She did what she had to do. What does this guy do? He insults her. I don't listen, this guy, it's, you know, it's better off not to be married to such a person. I'm not exactly one to uh, recommend divorces all the time, but sometimes it's really the only option. It's really the only option because men sometimes are really stupid. And obviously everything that I'm saying is kind of just the same thing on the opposite end. Sometimes women are. Sometimes women uh, don't care what their husband thinks. Sometimes women, they want the affection from other men. They want the affection from, from some, sometimes women are zonot. They're literally, they're just, they're just, you know, garbage. You know, just wicked, wicked people. Uh, this exists both for men and women. So, point is, the better you are, the better your zivug is going to be. The worse you are, the worse your zivug is going to be. If you are, have a good wife, she's a decent person, and she is doing something that uh, you don't want her to do, if you give her the right amount of affection and love, she will change. If you don't, she will never change. She will never change. That's the way it works in life. Uh, let's see. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions. Let's see. Compliments apply. Is the teaching, the teaching of yesterday in Jewish intimacy of how a husband going giving a wife compliments apply the opposite way? Uh, what is the ideal way and right ashkafa for a wife to have? Okay, so yes, the the ideal way is the is the opposite also as I just mentioned. Uh, but the uh, the Rambam writes that uh, a man has to honor his wife more than he even honors himself. He has to love her as much as he loves himself, and he has to honor her as much, uh, even more than he honors himself. Uh, a woman, on the other hand, has to treat her husband like a king. What does that mean, like a king? Literally, like a king. So a king comes into a room. Do you continue staying on the phone? Do you continue talking to your friend? No. A king comes. You end. You stop whatever you're doing. You go. And give the king attention. If you're on the phone with anybody, I'm sorry, I gotta go click. No explanation. Talk for another three minutes. Honey, one second, I'll be where with you. No, no, he's not, you're not a secretary. You're his wife. So husband comes into the house, a woman has to go immediately give him attention. Immediately go to where he is. He's at the door, go to the door. Don't stay on the couch, you know, sitting, you know, like uh, as if you're getting paid to, to warm it up. You know, get up, go welcome your husband. When your husband leaves, walk him out. Uh, you know, it's, it's a uh, when when uh, your husband comes home, let make sure he has something to eat. Whether you cooked it or you ordered it, it doesn't really make much of a difference if he if he doesn't care. But you have to make sure he has something to eat. You know, if uh, you know, as far as uh, intimacy, obviously, uh, you you can't be one of these wives that always has a headache. You always have a headache. Stay single. Stay single or go to the hospital. Fix your headache. You know, many women, they, uh, they don't want to be together with their wives, with, with their husbands. Why? They're, uh, no, listen, uh, uh, I'm not in the mood. Not in the mood, stay single. Why? Because, again, part of the wife, the Gemara says, a good wife is not one that just cooks and cleans. It's not, it's not that. It doesn't make it Eshet Chai. Eshet Chai is a woman that raises the kids with, uh, uh, with Torah, lets the husband learn Torah, and is intimate with them when, uh, uh, to keep him away from sin. If you are not together with your with your uh, husband when he wants to be, you are the Rambam Paskins, you are Isha Moredet, you are a wayward wife. Now again, this doesn't mean that a woman is, uh, you know, is, is uh, however, whenever. Obviously, there's a time and place for everything. If you make sure that your husband learns to lie, he's going to know that there's a time and place for everything. There's a time and place for everything. But a, a woman that is a good woman follows her husband. If her husband wants to move to a different city because there's better business over there or his rabbi's over there, she follows. What about if our mother is over here? doesn't make a difference. You, you go wherever your husband wants to go. Good women do not follow their parents. Good women follow their husband. Now again, assuming you've, you've married the, uh, you know, a normal person. If you married a terrorist, then, then get divorced. But if, if, if you marry a decent person that learns Torah, does mitzvot, and he says, listen, I want to move to Israel. A good woman says, okay, honey, we're going. When do you want to go? What about your mother? What about your sister? What about your father? What about your uh, sick uncle? Write them letters. Call them once a week. Why? You're married. 
You're not married to them. You're married to your husband. Many times women think that they are uh, responsible for their parents over their uh, husband. Wrong. Your number one priority is to your husband. While you are home, single, your number one responsibility is your parents. The minute you get married, number one responsibility is your husband. More than your parents. More than your parents. Never tell anybody about your marriage problems. Unless that person can help you because he's an expert. Or she's an expert. Don't tell your friends about disagreements between you and your husband. Don't tell your parents about disagreements between you and your husband. Never. Never tell them anything. In fact, don't even tell them about good things. Tell them everything is good. Limit talking about the details of your life. Why? Because if you tell your friends that your husband just bought you a brand new diamond ring, you tell your friends that your husband buys you flowers every Friday, you tell your friends that your husband calls you once a day and tells you I love you. Sounds good, right? Terrible. Why? Your friends are going to want to marry your husband. That's what's going to happen. They're going to be jealous because their husband doesn't do the same thing. They're going to be jealous because they don't have a husband. And they're going to justify somehow stealing your husband. So do not tell people the good things. Needless to say, don't say the bad things. Why? Because telling people that you disagree with your husband about something is not going to help you in any way, shape, or form. They can't change your husband anyway. Their advice is biased anyway, because they only know you. And it's also from their position. They have no concept of who, what, when, and how to deal with your husband. So telling anybody about your disagreements with your husband is never going to help you. You know you tell you about your disagreements with your husband? Your husband. Talk to your husband. Communicate with him. And people that tell other people about their problems, usually what ends up happening is that those people end up hating their husband. Even after you've made up with him, even after he bought you 500 presents, even after he told you, I'm sorry, 67,000 times, they're still mad at him. Five years have passed since he yelled at you somewhere. They're still mad at him. You forgot about it, but your mom is still mad at him. Why? Oh, he yelled at my daughter. When did he yell at your daughter? Today? No, no, no. When did he yell? Yesterday? No, no, no. When did he yell? Oh, you know, about 15 years ago. What? Why are you still mad? Because you can open it up again. I don't know what he does to my daughter. It's your fault. You're the daughter. It's your fault. Why did you tell your mom? Many women think it's like, a, it's like a mitzvah to share their problems. Generally speaking, it's always a bad idea to talk about your life. Always a bad idea to talk about your life. Especially about things like that between you and your husband. Even more so, it's a horrible idea to talk about other people's lives. Why? It's Lashon Ara. Many times, for some reason or another, people think it's a mitzvah to talk about other people's problems. Oh, you hear what happened? I think they're getting divorced. Oh, you know what happened? He just lost a bunch of money. Oh, you know what happened? They just bought a house. Guess what? All three of those are Lashon Ara. All three of those are sentences in Gainom. All three of them. You want to talk about something? Talk about Torah. Talk about mitzvot. Talk about... Chassidim, Tzadikim, Kiddushim. Talk about that. Don't talk about other people. Don't talk about your friends. Don't talk about your uh, other people. It's never a good idea to talk about other people. Women that talk about other people are for sure going to gain home. For sure. Why? It's Lashon Ara. Just the other day, just the other day, a woman came to me and told me, listen, I feel bad. Oh, why do you feel bad? Because I, um, you know, I uh, told my friend that uh, she should, uh, you know, do this thing. She should make up with, uh, with this person that she has an altercation with. Uh, I told her, how, how do you know about this altercation? Did she ask you about uh, what you think about this altercation? She goes, no, no. I actually, uh, there's another person that knew about this altercation. And uh, she told me about this altercation. And I decided to go tell this person. I said, okay, so you... So one person stuck their nose where it doesn't belong. Then they shared the Lashon Ara, And then you continued sharing the Lashon Ara, But not only shared the Lashon Ara, But you went to the source. Literally to the most inappropriate place in the world. You don't feel bad enough. Why? You just made enough sins that um, it's going to be very, very painful. Unless you do tshuva. Oh, really? I'm not allowed to do that? No. Do not talk about other people. One of the Hasidim from Gul had health problems to the point where literally they would 
have surgeries on his body on a regular basis. 15 years like this. 15 years. 15 years of suffering. Nobody knows what the problem is. Nobody knows what's going on. One day, he comes to the Admor Migul. He says, I don't know what to do. I pray to Hashem. I uh, do good things, but uh, my health, to ruin my life. That Mo Migul says to him, Kodesh Kodashim, says to him, you keep Shabbat? Yeah, for the Rav, one of the Hasidic, yeah, of course, I'm part of the Kila, yeah, sure. Oh, you keep Shabbat? What do you do on Shabbat? Literally, this is the type of, this, questions like this sound silly, but you'll see why that Mo Migul, for sure, had Ruach Kodesh. Why? You'll see. He says, then what do you do on Shabbat? What do you do on Shabbat? He says, uh, Shabbat, uh, well, you know, we have the family, the kids come over, Baruch Hashem. Oh. What do you do on Shabbat? What, what do you do when, you, when your kids come over? What do you do? And he says, to him, oh, Baruch Hashem, we have, this, we have this tradition in the family where on Shabbat, everybody comes with their stories of what happened during the week. So my daughter tells me about what happened in her community. My son tells me about what happened with work. The other one tells me about what happened with his friends. And we go and everybody shares a story. Ah. Dad Mommy Ghoul says to him, once you stop cutting people up on your Shulchan Shabbat, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will stop cutting you up. Once you stop performing surgeries on other people's lives, with these conversations on your Shulchan Shabbat, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will stop performing surgeries on your body. He stopped, and literally, miraculously, everything healed in an instant. Once he understood that what he's doing is not only not a good tradition, it's a sin from the Torah, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had enough mercy to punish him with in this world for, and give him the sign after sign, but it took him 15 years to finally get the message. He stopped, he healed. He stopped, he healed. People don't understand. Talking about other people will always lead to problems. Always lead to problems. I had one time a woman tell me that uh, she's very depressed because her best friend just betrayed her. Now, this happens practically every single second, but this particular story was was a uh, awesome enough in a negative way that it literally imprinted in my mind. Like I didn't know whether, like, what to do with myself when I heard the story. Listen to this: this poor woman has been having trouble having children for a while. One day, she gets pregnant. Waiting. Her friend, who was always in her business, discovered she's pregnant. I don't know whether she told her or she... Whatever. Long story short, she discovered she's pregnant. Fine. One day, the poor woman, literally short time within into the pregnancy, tragedy happens. She has a miscarriage now any woman that has had a miscarriage knows that they're always traumatic but a kadosh gave me the ability to get pregnant once but other will give you ability to get pregnant again you don't give up you keep going sometimes it's part of a tikkun sometimes it's a neshama that has to come to the world that way and you're helping them fix themselves so you can't look at it only in a negative way but needless to say it's always traumatic it's a horrible experience but some women are stupid. Some women are just simply stupid. How are they stupid? Well, since this woman, you know, she befriended this person. They were friends. They were close. And this, uh, you know, she obviously, for her, she waited for so long to get pregnant. Finally, she's pregnant. And then she has a miscarriage. It's a tragedy and a half. And her friend finds out about the, the tragedy. She's not exactly too sensitive over it, but whatever, she's there for her. Okay, fine. A short while later, I don't know whether it was a matter of days or weeks, but a short while later, 
the woman that had the miscarriage is invited over somebody else's house, mutual friend of some kind, and the friend, the friend, in front of everybody, says, hey honey, look, look, she talked to her, she also had a miscarriage. Now, if you don't understand this to be stupid at the highest possible level, then you, my friend, are stupid. And I have no problem telling you you're stupid. You're spiritually stupid. But unfortunately, some people are. Literally, she murdered her friend in front of everybody. Murdered her. Wow. She shared the most sensitive thing that could ever be. In front of a bunch of people. As if it just became public property that she had a trauma. Yeah, yeah talk to her. She also had a, a, a miscarriage. This woman tells me, I wanted to die. I wanted to die at that moment. I told her, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Obviously, the relationship suffered after that. And I don't even think that the people understand what they did and how they did like sometimes people literally murder other people in public what you're bleeding you okay what happened what, mean what happened you just stabbed me in front of everyone you just publicized my trauma you just publicized my my, my my personal life in front of people no I thought I was helping with help like yours I'm gonna ask for friends like Hitler but some people are so stupid spiritually that they think that it's their obligation somehow to share the personal life of other people. You want to share a personal life? Share yours, not other people. When is it okay to share other people's life? Never. Never. It's never a good time. It's never allowed to share other people's life. Never. And when people do it, and then on top of it, they don't realize what they did. It's literally like putting salt on a wound. And unfortunately, that happens very often with women. Women, some of them, God bless them, they have this gift, gift that's really a curse. They talk and talk and talk. But other people, talk about other people's life. Oh, he's, he's divorcing you? Oh, you hear that? He's divorcing, I told you. What? Some people do this. Literally, like, this is the reason why smart people usually don't have friends. Because it's very hard to find normal people. It's very, very hard. Very, very hard to find normal people. And, and, and for them to stay normal over a long period of time. It's very difficult. Point being is, Rabotai, do not talk about other people. Ever. Last but not least, don't talk about rabbis. Heretics are not rabbis. Good rabbis, like them, don't like them, don't talk about them. Why? The Gemara says that a person that speaks against a Talmud Chacham, a person that speaks against a someone that's a righteous person, and Trufala Makato, there's no cure to their ailment. Meaning, a Kadosh Baruch Hu is willing to erase his own name. He's willing to forgive a person for saying things against him, but he's not willing to forgive people saying against Tzadikim, against Talmidei Chachamim. Sometimes people say, listen, yeah, the rabbi, he did a shir this week. He's good. I like him. Don't get me wrong. I like him, but I think he's wrong. I like him, but uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't look good this week. I think, I think there's something wrong. I think there's something wrong with his wife. I think there's something wrong with him. I think it's, shh, quiet, quiet. Don't talk about people. Don't talk about people. Why? You're bringing problems to your life. Simple. You don't want to listen? Their blood is in their own hands. Their blood is in their own hands. It's, 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 this is just one of those things I've seen, tried and tested. I've seen it time and time again. People bring tragedy to their life. And I know people, most people are going to say, ah, it's too much, it's too this. By all means, at least you heard it. Next. Uh, my roommate in yeshiva told me about Brother Brighter Witch from Ol Sameach that has a clip that was rather pro of Lord Jonathan Sachs. And he wanted me to send you a clip. I told him it's better to ask you your advice first 
before even wasting time, since many people support him. Is it even worth it to waste time going against a rabbi speaking about him? Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really understand the point of the question. Like, if somebody is supporting a heretic, then obviously that that that, that shows who they are. That shows who they are. Shlomo Melech says it. Uh, the uh, person honors, whoever, praises whoever they uh, they uh, they want to be like. And uh, if they praise wicked people, that's who they are. Uh, so, again, I, I, uh, I don't know who, what, when, and how as far as all of the different names and so on, but if a person is bad, then he's bad. Anyone that praises him is bad just like him. Um, simple. So you don't have to necessarily send me a, a clip. I, you know, we've already discussed. There's a, uh, things that uh, Jonathan Sachs did that Rav Yashiv paskent him in Heretic. I'm, you know, I'm not even the shoe of Rav Yashiv. If he poskened him a heretic, what, what could I say? And we have obviously videos that we've talked about how he said things that are against the Torah. Now, people that are supportive of him, let it be supportive of him. What can I do for them? I, I, I know, generally speaking, people are not receptive to going uh, and, and uh, dis, you know, going against uh, uh, Jonathan Sachs. They have no uh, interest in doing it, especially since he died. But even when he was alive, people accepted him as the Mara de Atra of the uh, modern Orthodox Jewry. Uh, you know, whatever, that's, that's up to them. Uh, obviously, he's in a place where whatever he did right uh, and whatever he did wrong is, uh, is, is, is being shown to him. Let's just say that. Uh, but in regards to people supporting or, or, or going against, I can tell you this. The biggest uh, problem is not, uh, uh, you know, someone that passed away. The biggest problem are the people that are alive. And when people are supportive of Manus Friedman of uh, of of, of Mervis, uh, Fine Mervis, of all of the heretics that we talked about, that already tells you know speaks volumes. And the people that you mentioned are supportive of those people. So it's uh, you know that already tells me who they are. Tells me who they are. Uh, where do we find an accurate calendar for the parasha? Uh, you can download an application uh, called Bezat Hashem. Bezat Hashem has a calendar in it. The Bezat Hashem app has a new calendar in it, calendar feature in it. It's going to be upgraded even further soon, but it has a calendar feature in it. It's uh, brand new, uh, and it'll tell you the weekly parasha, it'll tell you when Shabbat comes in, and so on. So Bezat Hashem app, uh, you can use for that. You... Uh, don't really need more than that, but uh, there's uh, another app that I've recommended many times over the years called CalJ, C-A-L-J, uh, that tells the Shabbat times in the parasha. It's just that uh, with, uh, uh, with our calendar, you also have Torah accessible, but you have it, you have it. Okay, let's see what else. Should I delete the picture from her phone, from your mom's phone? Uh, you know, listen, if, uh, if it's her phone, you can't just go into her property and do what you want, you know. So it's not, uh, it's not, it's not yours to, to go into, no. I see. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, guys, I've answered all the questions. Baruch Hashem. We're also well over two hours. Baruch Hashem. Despite the Satan attacking again and uh, taking down one of the life sources, Baruch Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not allow them to ruin. He just distracted, but not ruin. So that shows us that Yetzirah doesn't like our lectures, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves them. Thank you very much for learning with me. HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless each and every single one of you. Uh, Bezal Hashem, we will uh, continue learning again next week. Anyone that wants to support our organization, wants to be partner in Kiruv and literally get an endless amount of mitzvot from the different wonderful things they'll become a partner in, uh, can donate at bezatashem.org or bhtorah.org or on the app. The app is a favorite for many people for both for watching lectures as well as for uh, donations. Uh, or you can simply send a check. You can simply send a check or you can wire. Whatever you want to do, certainly there's ways to do it. 
Thank you very much for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you. Call to Bechav HaAztacha. As soon as I knew what HaKadosh Baruch Hu really did for us, I felt ashamed. And I said, I have to throw all that I did in the garbage and give my life to you as best as I can. How could I think I knew God and treat him like, oh, I'm just going to ask him for things when I need to, when I'm in trouble. After everything he's given me, after the proofs, and when I started crying, I think that was what Rabbi Yaron said that sparked me to start crying out to Hashem. Boom. As soon as he said it, that said tears just would not stop. You keep crying until you start feeling less and less bad about yourself. Yeah.